All right, so we're going to start off today with a challenge. This could be for anybody, but this is for Mr. Ford. I got here some sardines in this tin. And uh, the challenge is to beat my time, Mr. Ford. All right, so I got a tin of sardines. And here we go. Start. Mmm. There is a reason for this. There is one. One and a half. No water allowed. That's two. One more. Don't worry, I'll get straps. It's falling apart a little bit. There we go. Time went 35. I'm glad I didn't say 30 seconds. All right. So here's your challenge, Mr. Floyd. I'll see you beat that. Now, what is this tin of sardines? Well, look on the back. It's got sardines, it's got olive oil, and it's got salt. So, we're studying solutions now. Overall scheme of things, we have matter, you can divide matter into mixtures and substances. Of course, substances would be compounds, H2O, CH4, so forth, and then elements, okay, which make up everything. Okay, but a mixture is two or more substances put together okay, in different combinations. Okay. The sardines would be a heterogeneous mixture because heterogeneous means not evenly spread. Okay, so pizza, concrete, stuff that is not blended evenly. Homogeneous means evenly spread. All right. So <clears throat> homogeneous mixture could be either be a solution or a colloid. Now colloid are made up of um, a solution in which the particles that are dissolved are a little bit bigger in size and they scatter light. So substances like milk, jello, fog, those would be considered a colloid because they're big, they scatter light, okay? They would be translucent, right? Whereas solutions, which we're, we're studying right now, okay, they're smaller in size, so atomic level or um, molecular level, they're homogeneous, okay? They are clear, they can be colored, like yellow, like a Mountain Dew or something like that, that would be um, still a solution. And when you put, when you make it, it's a physical change. It's not a chemical change. It's a physical change. You break things apart. All right. So with solutions, some key things here. Okay. Uh, I think Mr. Ford went over some of this, but solute is what's getting dissolved. Okay. The solvent is what's doing the dissolving. Okay. Sometimes it can be a little bit um, not so clear cut, but you, generally the solvent is the one that's in in the majority. Okay. So like example, air as uh, about 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, so nitrogen would be the probably the solvent and oxygen the solute. All right, so solute solvent, now when a solution is being produced, okay, the solvation process, not salvation, but solvation, looks like this, hopefully you can see it. H2O is a polar molecule, okay, and the general rule for dissolving is like dissolves like. Okay, so uh, water is polar, so it will dissolve other things that are polar. 
like ionic substances, which are really polar, and other polar substances. They will not dissolve oil. Like if I took this olive oil right here and put it into water, it would not dissolve. Okay, because oil are oils are nonpolar. Right? Solvation process, water is polar, you have the uh, positive on the hydrogens, <clears throat> negative on the oxygen. Okay, so they kind of surround the particles. Okay, so for example, salt and ACL. Okay, it breaks apart into the sodium ions and the chlorine ions, and the oxygens will nestle up next to the positive sodium. Okay, whereas the chlorines will be surrounded by the hydrogens, which are slightly positive. So that's the surrounding or the dissolving process. All right. So back over here, there's some terms you should know. Miscible means it's dissolvable, okay? It dissolves inside of it. Immiscible would be, okay, not dissolvable, so insoluble, okay? So oil, which is nonpolar, in water, okay, that would be non-dissolvable. If I took this olive oil and I put it in this water here, it wouldn't dissolve. There we go, all right? So make sure you understand those terms. Solubility, okay? You can, when you put a solute, for example, salt in the water, okay, it'll take a little bit. If I put a little bit of salt in there and I stir it up a little bit, it will dissolve. If I can still add more to it, it is considered to be unsaturated. If I kept adding salt to it, at a certain point, it would stop taking more salt. It wouldn't dissolve anymore, and this salt would just settle to the bottom. We say at that point, it is saturated. Okay, it's taken as much as it can take. Okay. Sometimes you can make a super, uh, solution super saturated though. If you take it, heat it up to a higher temperature, a lot of uh, substances will um, have higher saturation points at higher temperatures. So you can take it at a higher temperature and then uh, cool the temperature gently and it'll stay in solution. You say it's got more than it can take so it's super saturated. Those are pretty unstable though. They're not in equilibrium. So they'll come out of solution. If you put a little seed crystal in it, it'll crystallize right away. All right? So that's solubility. So saturated is when it's taken as much as it can take. Um, some of the times it depends on temperature. Like I just said, sometimes you increase the temperature, you increase solubility. Okay, but for some things, um, it goes up. For some things, it just stays steady. And some, for, actually, for some, it will go down. So if you look on this curve here, you've got temperature along the bottom, solubility over here. So as the temperature goes up, where potassium nitrate, okay, solubility goes up. Potassium bromide, solubility goes up. Sodium chloride, though, it doesn't really make much of a difference. It's kind of, it's, it's a kind of a straight line across. For some substances, actually, it goes down. So you can't really tell, but for most substances, do go up with temperature. For gases, though, it's just the opposite. Gaps, gases, okay, as you increase the temperature, the solubility actually goes down, okay? So think about a soda pop. Okay, if you have soda pop and you have it nice and cold, when you take the top off, you'll hear a little fizz coming out, a little gas coming out, but not much. But if you have it really warm, then when you take the cap off, sometimes it just flows out because all that gas, which is dissolved in there, will just come out of solution. Okay, so temperature has an effect on that. Fish have a problem, like sardines would have a problem maybe when it gets really warm in like ponds during the summer or creeks. Um, Dissolved oxygen goes down when it's get colder, but it goes dissolved oxygen actually um, the amount of oxygen is dissolved it goes down as the temperature goes up, so it looks more like this. Okay. Okay, when they do that, they measure that in parts per million, which is another concept you need to understand. Parts per million is how many molecules per million of molecules okay, of, of the whole solution. Okay, and it's measured by milligrams per kilogram. Okay, so if you look on the little scale over here, um, kilograms is here, grams is here, milligrams over here, of course, with the metric system, to go from milligrams to kilograms, it's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, and if you do that, that's a million times. Okay, so for example, in water, if you have eight milligrams of oxygen per kilogram of water, okay, you would be eight, okay, over one, or you'd have a eight parts per million, okay.
Okay, so that's pretty simple to solve. Okay, let me give you an example with lead and parts per million. So, for example, um, you have lead, find a playground, maybe there's 600 milligrams of lead found in about 1.5 kilograms of soil. Okay. What is the answer in parts per million? Well, it's pretty simple. You would just take 600 milligrams, divide that by 1.5 kilograms, and of course you'd come up with 400, so the answer in number four would be 400 parts per million. All right. So again, there are 1 million milligrams in a kilogram, so parts per million milligrams over kilograms. All right, now finish out the unit. A um, couple things. Uh, pressure. There's a thing called partial pressure of gases. Okay, partial pressure is the pressure exerted by the particular gas out of the whole um, solution. So, for example, on air, air is about 80% nitrogen. 20% oxygen. That's rounding off. There's other gases, but mostly nitrogen, okay, which would therefore be the solvent, and then oxygen. Okay, so to figure out the partial pressure of the oxygen, okay, you would take 20% of what atmospheric pressure is. Okay, and you probably know one atmosphere pressure is about 760 millimeters of mercury pressure. All right, so you just take 20% of 760, which comes out to be 152. So we'd say the partial pressure of oxygen is. 152 millimeters of mercury pressure. All right. So why is that important? Well, if you look here in the example, okay, quick bio, biology example. Um, in your lungs, you have these little sacs called alveoli. Some of you are probably familiar with that. Okay, that's where the exchange occurs. So if you take in air, okay, the partial pressure of oxygen is 152. In your blood, which surrounds the, the alveoli, it's about 40. So when that happens, you get Diffusion of oxygen into the blood always goes from high to low. Okay, so there's a something significant with partial pressures. All right, Henry's law. Are you familiar with that? With solutions, as you increase the pressure, you increase the solubility. All right, so think soda pop again. Okay, there's carbonation in the soda pop. You have CO2 dissolved in the uh, solution. Right. We already talked about temperature. Okay, the lower the temperature, the more it will dissolve. Okay, most substances, in this case, with CO2. Okay, so the lower the temperature, the more it dissolves. But also, the higher the pressure, the more it dissolves. All right. So when they bottle this up, they put it under higher pressure. Okay, that keeps more gas in solution. All right. So mathematically, it's expressed this way: S1, which would be the solubility in the first condition divided by the pressure of the first condition will equal okay, the new solubility over the new pressure. All right? So if you increase the pressure, you should increase the amount of solubility. All right? So if this was 2 over 1, if you increase this to 2 to, be, to keep the same equation, this has to become 8. So um, that's a direct relationship. Okay? So an example here, for example, a soda pop. Okay, let's say the solubility of the gas was 0.85 grams per liter okay, at a pressure of 4 atmosphere. Perhaps that's what they pressurize it at. Okay, if you open it up, okay, you're going to decrease the pressure to sea level pressure, which is 1 atmosphere pressure. Okay, so you're going down by 4 times as much. Okay, so you can kind of figure out what that's going to be. You're going to take the pressure down, so the solubility should go down too. But you can... Um, actually solve it. Here we go. So if you rearrange this formula, uh, the second solubility would be S1 times P2 divided by P1. Okay? So you would take 0.85 times 1 divided by 4. If you do that, you come out with 0.21 grams per liter. Okay? Of course, that makes sense. The pressure is going down, so the solubility goes down by the same amount. All right? Okay, so... Um, Again, that's how they keep things carbonated. Okay, if you release that and let it go to the atmosphere, of course, it goes flat and loses its carbonation. Okay. So one last thing here, it's kind of a sidelight here, but to mention with uh, solutions is this uh, concept of hydrated compounds. Hydrated compounds are compounds which have water okay, surrounding their structure, kind of locked into their structure. Okay. They have a certain number of water molecules per um, ionic compound. All right, so um, I know in class we worked with 
copper sulfate pentahydrate, but there's lots of them. So here, here's the case we have calcium chloride, CaCl2 dot 2H2O. So that means it's got two water molecules surrounding that calcium uh, chloride. Okay. Uh, the one with that blue crystal, which when you drive off the, the water, it turns white. That's copper sulfate pentahydrate. So CuSO4 dot 5H2O. So 5H2O is for every copper sulfate. And another example, barium hydroxide okay, dot 8H2O. So that would be barium hydroxide octahydrate. All right, so uh, I think that covers it for the lesson. Uh, make sure you put a little pressure on Mr. Ford. I know I don't care if he does sardines, but he needs to do something, right? Put a little pressure on him and, um, and uh, get the assignment done with this and um, have a good weekend.